an undisclosed location from a secret hunting spot known only to him and the guy who told him about it and possibly the guy who told the guy who told him. It's the show all about hunting in New Zealand and around the globe. This is The Hunting Show. Now here's your host, Stephen Spargo. Isn't it fantastic that Gerber is on board with us? We've been really fortunate to have Gerber come on board and help us attract new listeners and some new activity. Now, just for your information, to win those great Gerber prizes, all you need to do is be active on our Facebook page or on the forums. I'm definitely watching those, and I'm trying to be active myself. Or just send us some emails, info at thehuntingshow.co.nz, or check out our website, www.thehuntingshow.co.nz. Fill in the contact form on there. And again, I do apologize for the lackluster website that we have currently. It's because all we're trying to do at the moment is get listed on Google, and then we're going to launch a new website very soon. And there's going to be a couple of surprises with our new website. Technology. It's all around us, and that's most of us have a lot of technology with us at work, me particularly, working in a radio station. I have cell phones, computers, iPhones, iPads, um, generally contactable all of the time. Now, one of the best things I like about hunting, or one of the things I like most about hunting, is actually getting away from all of that technology. Sitting around a fireplace, sometimes with a couple of mates, and having a couple of quieties in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and just having a chat, also being one with nature. What are you thinking about the amount of technology we're now taking with us? I take a locator beacon and a GPS. I don't take my phone as a rule, but it's starting to get to the point where I can't tell my wife there's no cell phone coverage because a lot of the places I'm going are starting to get coverage. Or it's patchy, but I can generally get a text message or a phone call out at some point. Are you finding that technology is invading the space, or are you embracing it? Is it that actually having that technology means that you can go out a little bit more? One of my thoughts is, is if I could get email, maybe I could go out a little bit more work from the middle of the bush and uh, and get a bit more hunting time in. Part of me doesn't want to see that. I actually want to get away from technology. I want to not know what the rest of the world is doing for at least a couple of days here and there. I would like to know your thoughts about this. Interestingly, I do see a lot of hunters buying new gadgets. Up until now, most of the gadgets I've purchased have been things that make my life a little bit easier while I'm in the bush, but I wouldn't put them in the high-end technology part. I'm not you know, downloading hunting apps into my phone, although I do see some great callers available on there, although they seem to be mainly US calls. I, that's a bit of a side note. I just want to know, do you think technology is invading our hunting space? What pieces of new technology have you purchased? Have they worked? Are they all that it's cut out, out to be? Are you buying things and then trying them once, they're not kind of up to the, the, the sort of strength or the, the capabilities that you wanted them to have, and you've just kind of thrown them out or gone, well, I wasted a whole lot of money on that and I didn't need it. I even see these new cell phones, uh, emergency text message things. Are you buying these things? Are they exactly what you want, and are they making it easier to hunt, or are they just intruding on your space? I look forward to your feedback. Remember, The Hunting Show has a website, an email address, and a Facebook page, so feel free to give us feedback, particularly about that technology issue on there, because we are going to do a future show about that. So I'm looking forward to knowing what do you want to know, and do you want to know about new innovations and things coming out, or do you want to know ways we can avoid using technology or keeping it simple? You know, the old KISS theory, keep it simple, stupid. And just before I go on with the topic for today's show, another piece of technology I recently purchased was one of those electronic deer callers. And I'm going to be honest with you, I really like it. It does everything I wanted it to do, and in fact, it's made hunting a little bit easier. Maybe that's the problem. Or is it that now I'm not going to upschool on calling? I feel that I'll continue to use this, really like that little piece of technology someone else has put together, and personally not get any better at it. Now, some of you out there know me, and you also know that I'm not the great white hunter. I'm not the oracle of hunting knowledge. So things like this that make my life a little bit easier when I'm out there mean that I don't necessarily learn how to do things properly. So I'm asking you, do you think things like electronic callers are dumbing down Kiwi's ability to hunt? Or are they improving our ability to hunt and letting people that wouldn't otherwise get into it feel more confident about it? I look forward to hearing from you about that. Another great piece of technology is the Trojan Female Project and joined on the phone with Professor Neil Gemmell. How are you, Neil? I'm very well, Stephen. Thanks very much for inviting me to the show. Yeah, no worries. Now tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, um, I'm a Kiwi. I was born and raised in the Hutt Valley. Uh, did my undergraduate at Victoria University and then went overseas to Australia, did a PhD, went to UK and then came back to New Zealand and have uh, had positions at Canterbury University and now I'm at the University of Otago. 
last uh, the last six years, um, and I'm a professor here, working in the area of uh, reproductive and uh, genomic technologies. Now, the reason for this interview is all about this new thing, the Trojan Female Project, or the Trojan Trojan Female Technique. Can you tell me what that is in a nutshell? Well, it's um, it, it's a it's a little uh, it's a little complicated, but let me see if I can try and explain it very simply. So, what we've discovered is that um, there's a sort of an evolutionary loophole that we can exploit, or at least we think we can exploit. So, in the cells of all animals, um, there is a organelle, a, 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 a part of the part of the cellular machinery called the mitochondria, and that has its own DNA. It has its own mitochondrial genome. And this is inherited, uh, this, the mitochondria is normally um, referred to as sort of the battery of the cell. So it's involved in powering cells, and so it's actually crucial for all, all, um, all, all uh, animal life or plant life. And what was discovered is that this molecule is inherited only from uh, females to their offspring, so males have no role in passing this material on in most systems. And as a consequence of that, uh, this molecule is perfectly adapted for its role in females, but it's actually not perfectly adapted for its roles in males. And what we and others um, now around the world have discovered is that that actually leads to a really interesting scenario where that molecule may uh, not work so well uh, in situations where um, or a physiological situations where, where, where the, the, the role is male specific. And the key one that we've been looking at is sperm function and sperm production. And what we've discovered is that there are mutations that are perfectly fine for females, but if they're passed down to their male sons, that can result in the males being uh, either partially infertile or fully infertile. And the data for that are coming from things like fruit flies, but there's also some information that's coming from other systems like uh, European brown hare, uh, so you know related to rabbits, um, and we're also looking for evidence in in, in mice and uh, other systems. But um, at the moment, it's all laboratory uh, based in the laboratory. Uh, but we expect that if these mutations can be found in lab animals, that they could also be found as naturally occurring variants in wild populations of things like possums and ferrets and stoats and you know just keep listing the number of species that we don't want here in New Zealand and uh, we, we would think that there may well be a role for this mitochondrial mutation which affects males but not females to, um, to be used as a tool for control. And, and the way we would use that is that we would find these mutations um, in females breed those females up, and the females are fine, they're fertile, so they produce more female offspring, and then we would release those females out into the wild where they would produce, on an ongoing basis, males whose fertility is compromised. And the idea is, is that as you get more and more of these males who have infertility, then they would in turn uh, start to reduce the population growth, and ultimately uh, our models suggest that if you have enough of them, populations actually collapse and go extinct. So, so the, the idea is relatively simple, but it's driven by something that maybe is a little complicated. Yeah, how does, how does this differ from the, the sterile male technique, which I've heard about? Okay, so it's, it's almost the same. I mean, the sterile male technique, you know, which is famous for its use in um, screwworm flies, where you, you, you radiate the males and you destroy their uh, sperm effectively, and then you release them out into the wild, and then screwworm flies, males and females only mate. Well, females only mate once. So if they mate with an infertile male, they've lost their reproductive opportunity, and the population can be controlled. And screwworm flies cost the U.S., for example, one billion dollars a year. And this this, this process has effectively uh, resulted in a huge reduction in the use of insecticides and significant control of that population. Ours is the same, but the infertile males are produced on an ongoing basis as a consequence of females that are carrying these uh, bad mitochondria. So, so what you're saying is potentially, with the sterile male technique, obviously you have to reintroduce mammals, if it was uh, done in mammals, or males, all the, yeah. or males but yeah. mammal males, into the population all of the time, where the Trojan female technique could essentially be self-sustaining? Is that the... Yes, that's exactly right, Stephen. So the idea is that you release the females, the females reproduce, they produce more daughters who are fertile, who will, uh, and males who are infertile on an ongoing basis. 
So, you know, if you have enough females, uh, enough of your females in your population are carrying this bad mutation, mm. then all the males are going to be infertile and the population will start to crash. Is this genetic modification? No, it's not. That's even better, isn't it? Mm. Um, no, that, no. So we, we can't actually modify mitochondria directly at the moment. Um, and so what we're looking for are mutations that are naturally occurring. Um, I mean, there, there is a way to try to manipulate it so that you can get more mutations in the mitochondrial DNA using genetic engineering, but we don't think we'd need to do that. One of the real advantages of this is that these mutations, at least in the systems that have been looked at so far, are relatively uh, common. Mm. So if I screened 100, 200, 300 animals, I would expect to find one or two of these mutations in key genes in the mitochondria which are involved in energy production. And it's those sorts of mutations that we're looking for. Just, and, just yeah. to ask, a, it might sound like a stupid question, but has this ever happened naturally and had complete collapse of a species just because it's, it's been rampant in a, in a species of anything? Well, it's, it's not a stupid question, and, and the answer is, well, possibly, but nobody's ever really looked. Right. I mean, we, we sort of stumbled on this idea a decade ago, thinking about the problem in a quite a different way. So now we're talking about a control paradigm, but when we first started to investigate this idea, we were thinking about populations that were critically endangered, like Kākāpō, and, and whether mitochondrial mutations might be, in fact, one of the drivers of why these populations are going endangered and, and why they often have um, fertility compromise. So one of the things that you find in these inbred endangered populations time and time again is that male fertility is often heavily compromised. Sperm... They produce very poor, sperm, poor numbers of sperm. The sperm are abnormal in shape, they're abnormal in function, and they just don't work very well. And, and that, that pattern emerges in you know, cheetahs in Africa and kakapo here in New Zealand and a number of other endangered species around the world. So we wondered you know, 10 years ago, could mitochondrial DNA be, be a, an explanatory component of that? But, it never, before, but it's never, it had never really been looked at. And now there's been a few groups that have looked at it, and at least in European hares, it looks like that may be one factor that causes population decline in, that pop in, 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 in a population of European hares that has been studied quite intensively. Not to quote a Jurassic Park line, but doesn't life always find a way? <laughs> and life always <laughs> finds a way. Well, actually, that's something I've pondered for a while. Now, there are ways around this mitochondrial mutation, it would be fair to say. So... You know, I've, 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 I've tried. I've said relatively glibly that these mutations are bad in uh, males, but they're okay in females. I mean, if they were bad in females, also they'd be eliminated very rapidly. Um, and it may also be that occasionally, what we find about mitochondrial function is that, is that it's not just solely dependent on the DNA of the mitochondria. It, it's, it, it involves a cooperative system uh, where the nuclear genetic material. So this is the the, the the DNA sequences that we get from both mum and dad, they also make a contribution to mitochondrial function. It may be that there have been mutations in that genome which would compensate for defects in, in the mitochondria. I'll try and see if I can find an analogy that might explain that. Uh, 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 well, maybe we think about it like a, a hybrid electric car. You know, if, the, if you've got uh, an electric and a petrol engine, if they're both working, then that's really good. And if um, one's working, you're probably going to be all right for a while. And, and so if you think of the petrol engine as the nuclear DNA and maybe the electric engine as the mitochondria, uh, you could probably get by with a defect in the mitochondria if the petrol engine uh, was particularly good. Now, Does that help? <laughs> yeah, it does. Now, you, you've also stated in, in one of your articles that there's little danger of accidental release or cross-contamination or cross-species contamination. Little or is it none? Well, as little as in that unless the species hybridise, it would be, it would, you know, if they hybridise, then there's little. If there's no hybridisation, then there's none. So, for example, if we put this into possums, the chances that a possum breeds and produces fertile offspring with another species here in New Zealand, I'd have to say, is zero. Um, so it would be possum-specific. Could And the only way this thing could vector, in other words, the only way it could move, mm. is if we actually took a female possum that was carrying a mutation on a, on a plane or a boat or something and got it over into Australia. And even if it did get over there, the chances that it actually made a significant contribution to that population was going to be negligible. 
Um, so, the, so the chances of spread are, 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 are very low because the animal is the agent of its own um, dispersion. However, and, and the other thing that's neat is that because we know what mutations uh, cause the fertility compromise in some instances, and more accurately we know the mutations that don't, if we ever wanted to reverse this, all we'd need to do is introduce females that, that had mitochondria that were good for both males and females, and then we could restore fertility that way. Okay, uh, that, that's interesting. But could this be used in any species you wanted to get rid of? Well, I mean, some are going to be better than others. Right. Um, so the mating system in, of the species makes a big difference. So the screw, screwworm fly, which we talked about as the classic paradigm for sterile insect technique, uh, I mean, that's perfect because the females only mate once and then the females actually only, you know, live for a, you know, for a short period of time. So they mate and they die. And, and that situation is perfect for a sterile uh, male, sterile insect approach. In populations where females and males live for longer periods of time and where females may mate with multiple males, um, this works less well. But um, our models suggest that it could still work. Uh, it just takes a long time. So in possums, if we were to release, say, 1% of these Trojan females into a population every generation for 10 years, our models suggest that we would get some level of control after something like 20 to 30 generations. Now, on possum life scales, that's probably 100 years, um, which probably is not acceptable uh, for the short term, because we're looking for a shorter term solution. Mm -hmm. However, what we've been also thinking about is how this technology could be used in conjunction with existing uh, approaches, whether it be trapping, poisoning or shooting. And, and there, where you've had successful control of a population, uh, let's say you had 1,000 possums uh, in a particular uh, back block, and you've, you've, you've reduced the numbers down to, let's say, um, 10 or so per um, hectare or something, you know, relatively, well, relatively low numbers, not mm -hmm. hugely low, and then you start to introduce these Trojan females. When you've already had some level of suppression, then what we find is introducing these Trojan females would... Make it, uh, take a, make, make it so that the population takes a very, very long time before it ever becomes uh, a nuisance again and really starts to impact on our natural systems. So we think actually in that longer-term control, not necessarily in eradication uh, uh, situation, but in that longer-term control, this could have really uh, good effects for us. And, and technically, this, this could be applied to any species that has mitochondria. So, you know, we could... We could conceivably think about using it for a variety of, of species that um, that we don't want, mammalian pest species in, the, in, in New Zealand bush, or we could be talking about carp in our rivers, or we could be talking about um, uh, beetles and bugs and, and other things that we don't want in our horticultural and agricultural systems. So it is quite wide-reaching. Could this spell the end eventually to the use of poisons like Ternati? Yeah, well, I mean, you'd like to think it might, but the reality <laughs> Lots is... Lots of people that, would like to think it might. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure your listeners are very keen. And look, uh, I mean, certainly we, we would like to think of it as a way to, towards, uh, as an alternative. Um, I don't think it's likely to get rid of the existing technologies, not in a hurry anyway. I mean, we're talking about having this sort of technology um, through a proof of principle uh, in the next couple of years, and then if, if that's all lab-based, and then you know, I guess you'd talk field trials, and then if you, or, or some sort of controlled trial. Uh, so we're probably looking at, uh, at being a wee, a wee ways off um, having anything that's actually on the ground being used. But you know, if it, if it results in less poison being used, I think that would be a good thing. So again, to go back to that control paradigm that I talked about. Let's say you had a 1080 drop in an area, you got uh, animal numbers right down, you put Trojan females in, and instead of having to go back there and do something in maybe five to ten years, you might not have to do something for 20 or 30 years. That's the sort of time scales that we're talking about. One of the things that keeps crossing my mind as I listen to you is, is this going to be spelling the end to a lot of recreational hunting in New Zealand anyway, because most species that are hunted are introduced, and do you think the Department of Conservation... Actually, you won't use them. Do you think 
the powers that be could actually look at just getting rid of any species that was introduced with technology like this? Oh, well, I could imagine that would be a discussion we'd have. I mean, you know, different different groups value different things. I mean, we've had a big discussion about where the Polynesian rats should be removed from some of our offshore islands because they have value, right? Um, but, you know, ultimately they're rats and they do damage. Um, but different groups will value different things. So that's a, something, that's a discussion that New Zealand as a society would have to have. Um, I mean, do could we go back to a situation where we had no introduced mammals? Well, perhaps, but, I mean, so much of our livelihood, and indeed, I guess, uh, our lifestyle is dictated by those. It's probably unlikely, I would think. Um, and and uh, I guess the other thing to bear in mind is that it would be fair to say that some of the introduced species that we now have um, are, are being seen to be important suppliers of what they refer to as ecosystem services uh, and into our natural systems. Because we've removed species that once did those roles, um, and some of them are extinct now, and, some, and in some cases these other species are now fulfilling roles that those now extinct species had. And I'll give you an example. So it turns out that you know most of our, our flowering trees were pollinated by birds, and, and in some instances bats. And uh, in offshore islands, uh, things like um, uh, Pahutakara and some of those other species uh, are still pollinated in that way. But where, uh, where those uh, systems are relatively undisturbed. But on the mainland, where they have been disturbed, uh, it turns out that um, in a number of instances, rats are now the main pollinators of those species. So there's nothing more certain than change. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and uh, you know, New Zealand has fundamentally changed from the way it was uh, pre-human um, arrivals. Uh, it's certainly fundamentally changed from... Uh, uh, the settlement uh, post-Europeans, uh, and I guess we've we've now got what we've got. Um, we probably need to think about what we value and how we want to uh, protect and and um, and nurture that. Uh, uh, this could be part of it. I mean, I think most of us will accept that we probably don't want possums, we probably don't want stoats, we probably don't want weasels. But again, there mm. could be others out there that disagree with me. Um, I've seen the damage they do on native birds and plants, and I don't think it's acceptable. I'd much rather have, you know, forests that are, uh, you know, particularly down here in the south, you know, beautiful beech forests. I'd rather have those than plantation pine. But you know, that's my choice. That's that's what I aspire to, and that's what I aspire to my children having. But um, you know, we're, we're all different, and uh, it's a been an interesting discussion. Now, this technology sounds very exciting, and you've told me lots of positive things about it. it is there any negatives? Is there anything you've identified straight up as a negative? Well, I mean, you know, there's a couple of negatives. Um, I mean, the biggest negative is it might not work in, in <laughs> practice because, uh, I mean, for example, if the animals could cotton on to the fact that a male was carrying these bad mitochondria, they might choose not to mate with it. Um, that would be a major problem. Mm. And, and as you say, you know, nature finds a way, and, and it sort of does. So I do worry about those sorts of things, you know, this seems too simple, there probably is some uh, work around. But I mean the other thing is that in some instances the idea of releasing more animals to achieve control will probably not have a great deal of appeal. Hmm. I mean probably the classic example of this would be, um, if, what about if we want to try and um, control mosquitoes? So in malarial mosquitoes for example, the females, the, the one that bites you, it's the one that takes the blood meal, and so what we're actually would be talking about is initially releasing, if we wanted to try and use this as a control technology for mosquitoes, is releasing more uh, blood-sucking female mosquitoes. And I don't know if that would be particularly popular, even if they were sterile and known to be parasite-free. Um, but again, that's, that, that's one example uh, where it, it could all fall down. There's lots and lots of other sort of areas where we are uncertain about whether this would persist over time, um, particularly if it has, I mean, it can be sometimes very hard to measure mm. uh, what the fitness cost of a mutation is. If they're very, very subtle, uh, you know, it might only affect things by, you know, a fraction of a percent, but in an evolutionary context, that's actually quite a lot, and, and so these mutations could be eliminated can, over a period of time. Can you explain that a little bit further? So the fitness... 
Yeah, the fitness. So fitness is this concept that we in evolutionary biology like to use, and it's a sort of a combination both of your ability to survive and reproduce. Right. Okay? So if, if you survive and you reproduce, um, you know, enough young to, uh, to, to replace yourself, then basically your fitness is sort of one. And if you survive and reproduce and more individuals than are needed to replace you, then it's, it's greater than one, and so populations grow. If it's less, then populations tend to decrease. Um, and very in, in, in large populations over large timescales, really, really small differences from that sort of optimal one, like it could be 0.9999, will have an effect. Right. Okay? I mean, there's, there's also other complications like some random elements, but I won't get into that right? <laughs> because you, your listener's probably not interested in, in hearing all those um, but ifs and ands. But, but basically, if it's not optimal, it will slowly but surely get eliminated. Now, if you want to, if our listeners want to find out more information about this, where can they go? Well, actually, it's a really good question. I'm, I'd <laughs> like to say that my website's really up to date, and that would be a good place to look. But it probably isn't. Um, there's been a couple of articles written about it. Uh, one in the Herald, yep. um, which which is I think very good. Um, it's been something in the ODT. If they want to uh, wade through our scientific paper, if they're feeling particularly brave, um, then there's an article about it in in uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society B. Um, and there was also a very nice article in Landcare Research, uh, um, uh, and I should mention my collaborators on this, uh, Dan Tompkins from Landcare uh, in particular. Landcare wrote a, an article in, in one of their magazines um, about the Trojan female approach. So if you, if you type in Trojan female into Google and Gemmel, you'll, you'll come up with a, a bunch of different stuff, uh, in, including articles I might add by no relative, David Gemmel, uh, who was a science uh, fantasy writer. Mm. Um, <laughs> well, interesting. I, I typed that exact thing into, into Google and I got some really interesting responses before I added your name to the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, um, yes, yeah, thanks for that Stephen. Yes, I, I, it should be noted that of course there is a, a rather large um, contraceptive manufacturer <laughs> and, and you, you'll, get, you'll get a lot of that. <laughs> that, that, that. That bears that name, but I wasn't thinking about that when, I, when, we, when we named it. What we, what we were going for of course was the, the, um, the great uh, story of the, of the Trojan horse and um, and, and during the Trojan Trojan Wars, um, <laughs> the, the Greek course in the Trojan Wars. So um, it's that's sort of the idea of it is is that again these these females look perfectly fine, but hidden on the inside there's something intrinsically nasty. And again, again, probably we've all met gals a bit <laughs> like that. But um, whether whether they they, had mitoc- they carry mitochondrial mutations that would compromise their fertility, I don't know. I had to be careful what I said then because my wife listens to this show. Um, yeah, well, so does mine, might too. Um, you know, but she's not. A, I'm sure your wife and, and my wife are, are not Trojan females. No, I, I'm def- definitely not. If you're listening, right, <laughs> Professor Neil Gemmell, thank you very, very much for your interview. It's been an absolute pleasure. And look, I might even seek to get some updates on how this goes from you uh, periodically, eh? Yeah, no, that'd be good. We hope to have the first results from our fruit fly experiments around about August or September. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Next week on the show, we have an interview with world-renowned hunter and photographer Joseph Byers. He's a bow hunter that has hunted in New Zealand, Africa, America, and a whole lot of other places. I can't wait to interview him and let you know how it's going. Until then, guys, good hunting. Broadcasting from an undisclosed location, from a secret hunting spot known only to him, and the guy who told him about it, and possibly the guy who told the guy who told him. It's a show all about hunting in New Zealand and around the globe. This is The Hunting Show. Find The Hunting Show on Facebook and Twitter for up-to-date information on upcoming shows and topics.